In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, brothers and sisters, today we are going to celebrate the festival of Pentecost. And I want to uh, do a sermon with the title, say, Pentecost, a Christian community led by the Holy Spirit. And the text is coming from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I pick up the verses from verse 1 to 13. And let me read the key verses for you, which I select uh, is verses 12 and 13. And here he goes. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. Today is Pentecost. In my view, this is the most memorable, joyful festival for the early church. On Easter, for example, the apostles and disciples were not ready to meet the resurrected Christ. They were hesitant and doubtful about what Jesus had told them. The Son of Man will be killed and after three days rise again. Mark 8.31 As a result, they were scared and locked themselves from the outside hostile world. As for the Pentecost, the apostles and disciples had been transformed from intimidation into boldness and bravely came forward to the very front line, giving a long preaching before the enemy in the temple on what God has done in biblical history of covenantal salvation. They proclaimed that Jesus is the long-awaited for Messiah. Right, for, right after Peter's preaching, they witnessed the indwelling of the Holy Spirit converting 3,000 men to become Christians, which will be more than 3,000, including women and children. This tremendous conversion marks the birth of the Christian community, characterized by baptism, Holy Communion celebration, and household mutual support, self-giving communal fellowship. Yet, when the first generation Christians pass on the leadership baton to the second generation, somehow some local church leaders lose sight of the apostolic faith of how a Christian community is formed by the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. What they focus on and sought after is more the hardware, or I say the external form of being leaders, rather than the software or inner life of a leader in humility and self-giving love under the authority and sovereignty of the Holy Spirit. In the case of the Church of Corinth, the leaders keep focusing on what spiritual gifts they have or can have, rather than serve humbly before the gifts giver, that is, the Holy Spirit. That is to say, the leaders themselves gradually, consciously or unconsciously, become the center of focus, becoming egocentric, not theocentric anymore. St. Paul then will build and urge for their repentance, calling them to turn back to the right track. Only by submitting to the leadership of God, the Spirit can 
the Christian community manifests a life of unity in oneness and self-giving, not self-glorifying as the world is. Well, then we ask, how should a Christian community live and work together? In today's epistles, 1 Corinthians 12, the answer provided by St. Paul basically is, we should all surrender ourselves to God under the reign of the Holy Spirit, and we should love and serve one another in communal life. I believe that this perfect answer is known to everyone. The perfect answer often taught in Sunday school, from the pulpit, and in the Bible study group. But the longer the time we are Christians, the more struggle and questions about this perfect answer there are in, my, in our minds. Is the biblical teaching really applicable and workable? Can it be truly happening? Or is it merely something written in the Bible for discussion's sake? How come my fellow Christians are not behaving the way the Bible teaches. Can you show me where on earth such a perfect charity Christian community been found? Being a, being a Christian for over 55 years now, I can assure, assure you that we have a simple answer, but there is no automatic way to bring this simple answer into human reality. The people in the church of Corinth were remarkably talented and gifted, knowledgeable and outstanding. Yet they had trouble working together in unity and charity. They were notorious in forming different camps, in partition, and conflicting each with each other, as said in the epistle. For the Corinthians, not that they did not know the answer, but they did not surrender themselves to God in, repent, in, repent, in repentance. Thus, St. Paul had nothing to say except to repeat the same teaching, surrender to God, the Holy Spirit, learn to serve and love one another. I want to emphasize the whole essence of St. Paul's teaching is to remind us one simple thing in modern language. Holy Spirit is the boss. We are not. When St. Paul comes to deal with the Korean church leaders regarding their spiritual arrogance, his primary focus is not spiritual gifts. Rather, he talks much of how to grow spiritually. What St. Paul simply said, everyone has gifts of some kinds, but not everyone are spiritual growing. You can be ta talent and powerful in some areas, but it does not equally mean you are already a spiritually mature person. So St. Paul does not direct us to explore how to have more spiritual gifts, as many current psychological tests do. Instead, St. Paul directs us back to the sovereignty of the giver, the Holy Spirit. St. Paul's intention is to direct our attention back to God the giver when we are exploring our gifts. Therefore, St. Paul lays down a basic principle for us to understand ourselves in relation to God. And in verse 3, St. Paul said two things. One, from a negative note, no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says, 
Jesus is accused. Then from the second, from the second uh, point, uh, positive, uh, here the, the, from a positive note, and he said, "No one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit." First, anyone who curses Jesus is not from the Holy Spirit. This means God will not curse Himself. There may be cases that a human son curse his father, but God the Spirit would not curse God the Father or vice versa. There is no accusation in between God the Trinity. They are in unity and in oneness. Strangely, who cursed Jesus? There is a controversial understanding in the exegesis of the text written by St. Paul. Biblical scholars agree that not one explanation can fully satisfy the exegetical challenge. So no, satisfy, uh, no satisfactory answer who and why Jesus was cursed in the Corinthian church. My thought then is St. Paul's intent to tell us that God will never contradict himself. And any contradiction is not coming from God. It can only come from the deceiver. This applies that splitting the church in division is never come from the Holy Spirit. Now, we worstly Anyone who confesses Jesus as Lord must come from the Holy Spirit. That simply means it is the Spirit who leads you in truth, as said by Jesus in St. John 16, 13, verse 13a. And here he goes, But when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. That is to say, today, if you are baptized and confess Jesus as Lord, that confession does not come from your super intellectual, scholarly learning, or human wisdom. It is merely under the Spirit who guides you into the understanding of the truth and converting you to become a Christian in the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm not sure if you have difficulty taking this saying seriously. Very often you are told that you are an autonomous being. You have the right to make decisions on your own, to choose your friend, your partner, your hobby, your sexual orientation, your study, your right to take ecstasy, and even your right to terminate your life. This my own self-monitoring life philosophy gradually shapes our paradigm of thought. Then we believe that it is me to make decision about Christ. We have a choice to select a larger church, a better Christian program, a better preacher, a less suffering journey, a better house group, and so on. Once Christianity becomes my choice, the whole scenario changes. I become the consumer. Christianity becomes the commodity. The clergy becomes the salesman. The church becomes a religious club. Sooner or later, I will find it difficult to swallow the teaching of self-giving, to offer myself as a living sacrifice and spiritual worship. When St. Paul said, no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit, he means that without the Holy Spirit, there is no way we can confess Jesus as Lord. 
In spiritual reality, truly, it is the Holy Spirit who leads someone to share the gospel with you. It is the Holy Spirit who eliminates your understanding of who Jesus Christ is. And it is the Holy Spirit who connects you to a Christian community so that you can join a spiritual home. All this good work are initiated and arranged by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, we are not so autonomous as we think. Before our birth, God is already present in our mother's womb for us. God is the one who gives us different gifts when we are still a baby and continues to give us additional gifts in our growth and development. Today, whatever we have achieved or ascribed are from the grace of God rather than taken as our own human achievement. Based on this conviction of Christian faith, St. Paul then said, the spiritual gifts granted by God are for the common good of the Christian community, verse 7. In God's mind, He never gives gifts to us for our own self-benefit. It is also the same Holy Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. Verse 11. This shows God's sovereignty among his people and his in, home, in, and in his own church. Thus, the Holy Spirit can grant the people in Paul's times the gifts of utterance of wisdom, utterance of knowledge, stronger in faith, healing power, working miracles, proclaiming prophecy, speaking in tongues, interpreting tongues, and so on, verses 8 to 10. In our time, gifts from the Holy Spirit can also include our singing voice, wealth, health, caring, peacemaking, EQ, IQ, academic and critical thinking, professional expertise, family, and so on. Seeing ourselves in this perspective, we would have a rather different understanding of ourselves and God. We become a far more theocentric, which is God-centered person. If a person changes in this way, he or she would be spiritually growing. If the congregation grows together in this Christ-centered direction, the community would be in charity and unity. So in my conclusion, Pentecost is God, the Holy Spirit, dwell with you and in you, St. John chapter 14, 17, verse B. The Holy Spirit reveals His work and power through the apostles in the early church. The Holy Spirit will bestow gifts to His servants for the common good of the church and for the sake of proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ and for building the body of Christ. Therefore, the primary focus, the primary concern of St. Paul as about the, uh, uh, as about the Korean church is not that they do not have gifts nor they do not know their gifts. The main problem is they are too egocentric, too focused on self-interest and self-conscious. They have gradually put themselves into the center of focus and simultaneously displace God out of their midst. In order to break up this self-centered lifestyle, St. Paul asks us to restore the relationship with God by putting the Spirit of God in the center. This is the only way that we can serve together humbly when we exercise our spiritual gifts. If not, we will be tempted to use our gifts for self-glorification and take away God's glory. It is why St. Paul reminds us 
of the baptismal vow at the end of this text, verse 12. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. In baptism, we are called into the bond of oneness, regardless of race, of race and economic class. We are asked to submit to the sovereignty of the Holy Spirit and His Lordships over us in His Church. This will be manifest in the spirituality of the congregation, how we live out our servanthood among one another. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, St. Paul then reminds us that the greatest gift bestowed by the Holy Spirit is agape love, the self-giving love. It is by this self-giving love that conflicting opinions and different characters can be resolved and the multitude of believers become one body of Christ. Amen.